I kind of let the cat out of the bag a little bit. But tonight, um, I am joined by Miss Bonnie Short, and um, we put a little note in here to remind us to tell you about how um, we really come um, into education from different lenses. I am a secondary person. I've taught every grade, 5 through 12. Probably my favorite grade, does, I think every teacher has a favorite grade. I'm not the only one, right? Um, my favorite grade is eighth grade. Um, I love all grades. I love them all. But my favorite grade is the one that most people say I would never want to teach that grade. Um, I just love that age group. Um, I just always have. Uh, Bonnie, I'll let her tell you a little bit about her background. So my name is Bonnie Short. I'm the director of the Alabama Reading Initiative, which is kindergarten through third grade literacy. And I have an elementary background. Um, I am an early childhood major. And my mother said, hey, you don't want to be an early childhood major. You're not going to be marketable enough. And I said, mm, I don't want to be with older kids. Well, little did I know that as I went through my teaching time, I did teach summer school to fifth graders who needed extra um, help and support and fourth graders and loved that too. So um, sometimes it surprises you what you might end up doing. But I did some coaching along my way as a um, reading coach. I was an assistant principal and a principal and now landing um, at the State Department supporting the Alabama Reading Initiative. So you have your elementary support and you have your secondary support. And we thought it was important that you understand that when we talk about all of these um, aspects to support you, the norms and stuff, Harry Wong, that you are going to understand that this is going to work no matter what the age group is that you're working with. These are going to be great strategies that are going to help you with your classes. And you know, I was I got to share with you today in North Alabama, I was meeting with a group of brand new teachers, much like yourselves, um, who are part of a, a network up there. And they asked me to come speak. And I had did the same activity I did with um, that we did with you guys on the first day about pick your song. I shared with them some of your songs and they were like, <laughs> yes. Um, the one thing that was so cool, I just have to share this with you. So I'm doing my little spiel about teaching and this one teacher in the classroom, she says, you know, I'm from, I'm from Rainbow Middle. And I said, I taught at Rainbow Middle. And she, I said, what do you teach? And she said, well, I taught, um, I teach English. I said, I taught English. What grade? She says, eighth grade. I said, where's your classroom? So she is in my classroom that I taught in, in my early to mid 20s i actually did my national board certification uh, bonnie short is also an mbct we have gone through it a couple times couple three times um and so um having gone through that process it's really if it teaches you anything would you agree bonnie it teaches us to be reflective absolutely and you always are looking back um i was i'm trying to see do any of you teach um upperclassmen juniors and seniors Let's see some raised hands, those of you who teach those big kids. I, I do. Kind of, I'm sorry. I do. Thank you, Thomasina. Um, so I was, I see, and Jeanette, I'm seeing several hands. Thank you. So I just want to give y'all a little perspective. So I was 21 when I started teaching, and my very first students were 18. Um, some were 19. And I was teaching English. And I'm five foot nothing. And, um, and these were, um, I mean, these were kids that had been in lots of, um, they had had lots of struggles through their, you know, 12 years in education. And I'm so thankful that those kids became my kids because that's why I'm sitting in front of you today is uh, just really taught me how to be a teacher. And I'm going to be honest, um, Bonnie, some of the things I learned to do with those kids who came to me as 17, 18 year old children who could not read who did not know who Langston Hughes was or James Baldwin and hated poetry and hated reading. I stole strategies and protocols from elementary teachers on how I could be a gap standard for these kids. So just like Bonnie said, um, these are just great activities that no matter what content, what grade level you teach, we know these are things that you can put in play um, immediately. I have to give a shout out to my people over in the Center Point area because I did see an Irwin friend right there and I went to Pinson High School. So I'm loving that. Um, I taught in Gardendale, started in Gardendale in Jefferson County and then went to Auburn City and Lee County. So I have made that, um, that middle trek and uh, Melissa, you're the Northern girl, aren't you? Yep. 
That's right. That's right. So I'm out in the Gadsden, Etowah County, um, on the northeast side of the state. So we have had some fun. Now I gotta give and I gotta go back and see. I loved how I sent y'all an email at eleven o'clock last night, which I should not do, but <laughs> right now that is the best I can do. So I sent you an email last night and I know it was late. And I'm like, okay, they won't see it till tomorrow. And it said, Don't forget tomorrow is mug night. And instantly I started getting these messages. It's like, oh no, no, it is not mug night. It is snack night. And I'm like, oh, oh my gosh. Okay, people are Shanty, they are listening. So, and I've got to tell you too, so Mug Night, it is coming. And the two ladies that have Mug Night, they got big plans. And if I took that from them, I would never hear the end of it. So on the count of three, I hope you have your snacks ready. We want to see what you, oh, I'm already seeing my favorites. On the count of three, let's see what you got. I, I'm going to have to take some pictures here. All right, let's see what you got. On the, on the count of three. Hang on, these are too good. Keep them up. I'm trying to take pictures here. All right. Oh, <laughs> peanut M and M's. Okay, I'm or, seeing chocolate chip freed. Oh, the flavor twist. Oh, I see some combinations of Mountain Dew, Doritos, and Snickers. Did you see that one? Cheez Its, Golden Flakes. Oh, um, got Cheerios. Love that. Oh, sesame seeds. Um, sunflower seeds. But who's that? Popcorn. Pistachios. Okay, we got some healthy people in the room. That's awesome. As I'm showing Sour Patch Kids. Yes, um, I made you just can't a lot wrong. of lays. Um, I can't see what Lisa's is. I'm trying to figure out. Um, oh, pork rinds. Yes, ma'am. That is the perfect seven o'clock snack. Kit Kats. Oh, these are so funny. Hot chews. The Rainbow? combination. I hope you are all scrolling through the pictures like I am. I love how folks have those healthy carrot snacks. That must be so yummy. Um, is it uh, Miss Daly? That is so good of you to be eating so healthy. Um, and yes, and if you um, would like to share yours in the chat. Oh, that is so funny. I've got some great pictures. Um, next week, um, well, next week I'll share. I'll share with you what next week is because um, th that was a special request as well. So thank you for sharing your snacks so everybody can open up your Mountain Dews and your snacks and get comfy. Um, we are also excited to be at home tonight and hoping our pets and our children and everybody behaves. Um, but tonight's agenda is we're just going to go over just a couple of reminders. We had a couple that had some issues with links, and I think we might have one or two in our room today that are new. Um, so if you are new in the room tonight for whatever reason, will you um, will you raise your hand or give us a thumbs up so we can know who is new tonight? And I'm going to start searching just a little bit. All right. Thank you, Jay. Glad to have you. I feel like I'm at church. Oh, I saw a hand. I see you, Tasha. Thank you. Love it. So glad y'all could come. Absolutely. Absolutely. The more the merrier. Um, so we thought it'd be important to go over some reminders. We're going to talk a lot about Harry Wong. Have any of you heard of Harry Wong? Or you're probably like, who is this person? Um, Kiom, yes, you're not alone. A lot of people are like, huh? So we were, we're going to, and I actually, I should grab my book. I'm going to grab it when we take a little, a little stretch break. Um, Harry Wong is one of these um, folks that if um, you've been in education minute, especially when you're a new teacher, someone will give you this Harry Wong book and say, here, do what he and his wife say. And those of us that got these Harry Wong books, I mean, like they're Bonnie, I don't know what yours looks like, but I mean, it's dog eared. It's got coffee stains on know. it. Yeah. <laughs> It's my sticky nose. And if I hand you a Harry Wong book, I will say you can't go wrong with Harry Wong. That will be my slogan that I will say with you. Bonnie, you said it before I could. Yes, we have been, we've been, we've been saying that for about <laughs> weeks. So I'm glad we got it out there. Um, we also want to know, want you to know, like, what are those things in those first few days? Now, interestingly enough, some of you are in your very first few days. You were just hired last week or two weeks ago. Some of you were hired at the beginning of the school year. So we know some of you are at different stages of newness, but we feel really, really good about what we're gonna share today. Um, I feel like I, it really yes. 
I feel like I say this every time, but just as a reminder, we always want folks to know that you are being recorded, that these recordings, and we have we have been meeting for the last two weeks with um, curriculum leaders, superintendents, and, and district folks around the state, and we have been sharing with them these videos. Now, what we do every night that we meet, I go through and remove all of our chat afterward because we want that to be vulnerable time for you to ask whatever you want to ask. So no, once we finish and we say, do your homework, we stop recording and that does not go outside our little community. But the content that we are providing, we want this to be for the rest of the state to be able to have access to it. And we did not expect, expect this to explode like it has, but it has been wonderful to know that so many other teachers like yourself um, are being able to get some support from this. Um, don't forget to complete the attendance survey. I got to say, you guys have been awesome at that the last two times. So that is critical. Do not leave tonight because it's time stamped. So we can see, you know, when it was submitted. Um, and if you want power school credit, everything is still the same. And of course, um, many times you will send us emails and I know I sound like a broken record, but you know, we're trying to teach capacity. So if you are looking for an answer to something, I often say, go check the prep resource doc. So everything that um, we think you will need, we are trying to put everything on one page for you. I must say what Macy put in the chat. She said that at her um, university, that this is a textbook, that they're using this as a textbook. And she also said, her professor says, it's not the right way, it's the wrong way. I like, I like your, um, what you've shared in there. That's great. She knows we're, we're totally going to steal that. Yes, absolutely. Love that. So I'm going to pass this to Miss Bonnie Short who, to start us off tonight. So we're really going to talk a lot about norms, classroom norms. And when we talk about that, we're really looking at those high expectations that can be behavioral, academic, or social. Um, and so when I think about that, I think about... Um, norms that I said in my classroom when we were talking about, um, we had an overall norm that was called respect and you were respecting yourself, which, which covered that learning part. You were respecting others, which taps into that behavior part and the learning part. And then you were respecting property. And so it really helped to kind of think about um, all of those elements as we talked about it. Um, you want to have those academic norms so that you can talk about the attitudes that students need to be successful. Um, we want to make sure that student behavior is not a problem. Just think about it. If we were on here and somebody was doing something crazy in the Zoom and we were all distracted, that would not make for a good learning environment for you. So we've got to make sure we set those norms for our students so that we get the behaviors that we want to see. And um, the social norms, just things that we would generally expect. And when I think about this one, I really think about um, as we go to ch church, there's a certain expectation about the way that we um, go and enter the church, how we dress for whatever given church it is, um, how you're going to behave um, before and after. So there's kind of just those overall expectations. And so that's what we're trying to create in our norm in our classroom is what is the expectation for our classroom? And then when we're looking to establish the classroom norms, we want to set that tone for the class. How does it feel? Just like for church, how does this particular um, area, this particular room, how do we need to act and behave? What is the tone? We need to provide clear guidelines on what we need to do to behave. Um, clear expectations. Students know exactly what you want to see and what their peers want to see when you're going into those rooms. And then it makes it makes it to where students and teachers can feel safe and valued. And when I talk about safety, I'm not just talking about like um, like tornado drills and fire drills and things like that, but I'm talking about feel safe to be able to answer questions or ask questions. that They don't feel like they're going to be berated or feel bad if they answer it wrong, that their class is going to respect them. And so we look at, um, when we talk about norms, we're not just talking about um, a standard rule. 
look at those first two, developed by the teacher or developed by the community. And I want you to think about that. Um, think about times when uh, a standard has been set for you by one person and they say, this is the way it's got to be versus a community. Which one do you think students are going to be more willing to go forward with to obey? Which one are they going to be more willing to be a part of? It's going to be your community because there's going to be an expectation that's set not just by one individual, but by many. And so you want to make sure that um, you really are working to develop that community expectation. Um, keeping things safe and running efficiently, establishing or establishing how we learn best together. Non-negotiables versus ne negotiables. And what that means that, is that as time goes on, you're willing to shift what needs to take place for your norm. Rules are followed, but norms are upheld. That means that you might have a classmate that says, well, remember, we agreed that when somebody was talking, we were going to we were going to listen to them, that we weren't going to talk on top of them. Rules are enforced and norms are agreed upon. Rules prevent chaos, but norms prevent accountability. And accountability um, takes us to higher expectations that we want to make sure we're having norms. Now, one of the things that you know, we wanted to do because we know we have a very broad audience. We've got, um, you know, fine arts, we've got career tech, we've got English teachers, science teachers, we've got teachers that serve multilingual students. So we thought it would be helpful for you just to see some examples. And I totally ripped these off of, you know, I just went to the internet to see, let me find some examples. So if you are a math teacher, you know, these are, these are some examples of what a math norm might look like. Listen to what others are saying. You might learn from them. Do you see that? Um, you see this Ms. Long's classroom norms show up on time. Um, check your agenda. That sounds like some of the things we've been saying. You know, check your resource page. Um, you know, watch your voice level. You know, she's very specific about that. Be a good citizen. Um, for the big kids, you know, I'm looking at the one in the middle, keep all cell phones put away, be responsible, trash goes in the trash can, um, hashtag not your maid, you can definitely tell that's a middle or high school person, um, you see on the top right about communicating, um, to, to know your body, to know yourself, to stay engaged, these are just um, examples of what that could look like. Now, what you can't do is, and we say this all the time, if you try to make a rule for everything, because Bonnie just went through the difference between norms and rules, um, if you try to make a rule for everything, it's overwhelming, right? If you try to make a norm for everything, it's also overwhelming. So you really want to think, what are those things? And that's what we're going to practice a little bit. What are those things that we know are going to have the most impact in our classroom right away? Um, hey, do you remember as a student yourself, as a, do you remember seeing teachers that all they did all day long is yell? Do you remember those teachers all day long? They just yelled, they projected their voices. And I always thought, gosh, they've got to be really tired at the end of the day when all you've done is just project your voice. By establishing norms and these sorts of um, protocols, what actually happens is the kids learn, okay, this is the expectation, and it reduces the need to be so reactive to different um, behaviors. And I don't know if Jeff, Jeff said he had another ball game tonight. He said, I'm going to join if I can. So Jeff, if you're here, feel free to unmute. Um, he was with me this morning with the new teachers, but I wanted you to take a really good picture of his teacher of the year picture. What do you see? Do you see he has three norms? These are his three most important critical norms. And if students do these things, then he knows he's going to have a more efficient classroom. So some things we want you to think about is, you know, one, how to get started. So if you come up with the norms, then they're rules, right? Pretty much. So the thing about norming is it is a collective thing. So we we put it for the kids and we're like, okay, yesterday was crazy. Um, yesterday did not go well. What could we have done differently 
so that that does not happen again. So for an example, you know, you share an expectation and you tell them, you know, like texting, it may communicate disrespect to you and make you concerned about classroom disruptions. You want to create a space in the class for students to maybe get in small groups and say, all right, it's important to me to be a good teacher to you. It's important for you to be able to learn. So asking the students, what does a good classroom environment look like? Now, it's funny, your kids are going to be like, kids are quiet, and it's usually the one that's the loud one. I'm like, yes. So, yes, students, um, you know, have um, classroom behavior. Um, what conditions are needed in order for students to feel safe participating in class? What is considered acceptable or unacceptable classroom behaviors? If you say that up front, then you can have really meaningful conversations with them. I thought we established X, Y, or Z. Um, I have seen some elementary teachers, and I think we're going to be talking about this in a couple of weeks when we get into um, discipline and de-escalation, where if a third grader, an eighth grader, an 11th grader breaks a norm or a class rule, rule the expectation of us is to say, what rule did you break? Why did you break it? How did that make you feel when you broke that rule? How do you think that made everybody else feel when you broke that rule? Really creating accountability for our students to think about their actions. So what we thought we could do is let's just start with a practice exercise. So I'm going to put a link in the chat. Um, let me do that now. And I know how many of you have used Padlet before? Is this new to any of you? I'm seeing some heads shaking. Okay, let me put this link in the chat. And we'll see, give me some thumbs up if you are able to click on it. And I'm going to pull it up as well. Okay. So as you guys are clicking on that link, and I will go to the page too, is I want you to see there's going to be a series of columns and I want you to think about us. So um, Miss Washington, Miss Gilliland, Miss Short, we are the teachers and you're the students. So we want you to think as students in this prep program, in this learning community, what does productive learning look like for participants? So we know what, what we need to do as a student, as a participant, what would it look like? You know, that you know that you, that you well, I'm gonna give away. You come up with your own. That you're I see some are already starting to put some things on there. What conditions are needed in order for teachers to be engaged and prepared? What do you need to do to make sure that you are here in this and that you come to every session like, okay, I know what I should have done and what I will do. And what are those things that encourage or discourage an optimal professional learning experience? So let me pull this up and wow, some of you have already gotten busy. Wonderful. So if you would look at these four columns and it, I would like each one of you to at least put one comment and you can even comment on someone else's comment if you want to like, yes, what he said, but asking yourself, what can you do and your fellow prep preppers, prep participants, um, colleagues, do to make sure that we are creating optimal norms. Now, as you're doing that, and we will, you know, play some music to give you some time. Normally, we would do this on the very first day, but I, it was important to us that you saw things that, you know, maybe someone was unmuted. We, you know, I think we heard the, the shopping channel a little bit last week, um, or someone asking a question that was on the prep um, resource. Think about some of the things that we could do that would make the best experience for each of you and certainly for those that will be viewing this later. The things that you post on your wall or you have on your Google Classroom that says this and you discuss it every day, here, here are five norms so that there is no question. I visited a school on whatever yesterday was, was that Tuesday? On Tuesday, and they had their norms posted in their school all over the place. I mean, I probably saw the norms in five different places. And just, and I was only on two different hallways. So I think, I think that's another aspect is that you really making sure that you're being pervasive with making sure that it's, um, it's there and you're aware Ooh, so really. norms or classroom norms mm -hmm. 
These are great. These are really, really good. Um, and do you see this required no learning curve? I mean, you just give kids the link and they know what to do. You can put a lot of backgrounds. Uh, Sue Ellen Gillen, who is our um, tech queen um, at the State Department. Um, Sue Ellen, do you have any other, I mean, I'm put, throwing you under the bus a little bit, but in terms of Padlet, some other ways that they might be able to use this tool? It used um, a few different ways, but mostly, um, having students use this for an opportunity for um, a question and answer um, parking lot is a great way to um, have students kind of engaged, but yet thinking about um, what questions they have and then being able to add those as they move um, through an assignment, um, especially in large group. Also, um, being able to collaborate on a group project to kind of um, have some uh, ways to think about organizing the project collaboratively and then being able to get feedback on a plan for a group project is another way. Absolutely. Thank you. I've seen it be used as a storage for resources too. So you might have oh, a column yeah. where it's a, you know, it could be, you know, math, math um, resources that they would need, or maybe you have, you um, different research that you're doing. And so there would be resources, um, different topics across the top. Parent resources. Yeah, these are great. I, I am really, um, I really appreciate how you are lifting one another up. I mean, that's why we do this. This is, we're trying to build a community and it's it's wonderful to see all the positive feedback you're sharing with one another. And that's what we want our, we want our students to do that as well. So we will take your, um, now that we've had this shared opportunity to discover, okay, what should our prep norms be? We'll work over the next week to take your feedback to create norms to share next time. So we've got good old Harry Wong and the first days of school. And we're gonna to move to a few quotes. And as I read these quotes, we're just going to take a little pause, a little think time, because um, that's always a good norm is to have a little think time. And so I'm going to read the norm. We've got three of them. But as I'm reading them, I really want you to think about which one speaks to you the most. Which one do you really think is the most applicable to you and where you are right now? The number one problem in the classroom is not discipline. It's the lack of procedures and routines. The most successful classes are those where the teacher has a clear idea of what is expected from the students and the students know what the teacher expects from them. All teachers know that students learn best by doing. The only way a teacher can have a classroom in which students can learn by doing by discovery, by activity, is to establish routines and procedures. A well-managed classroom is task-oriented and predictable environment. So as you think about those items, um, which one of these quotes one through three, spoke the most to you. And you've got a poll that popped up. And so you're just going to choose one, two, or three, which one of those was really the most impactful to, to you. And you can see the poll moving. It's almost like a race. Sorry, there's five that have answered. So we've got a handful more that need to give us an answer. One, two, or three. Yeah, thank you for realizing my extra two was a three. Got sticky fingers tonight, apparently.
It's a smart bunch. They got they have this cover. <laughs> I say we have 148 participants. Let's see if we can get, you know, about 30 or 40 more. Harry Wong has a lot of great resources out there. Um, you can go and you can Google Harry Wong on YouTube and you'll see some videos that he has. Um, another great resource for um, classroom norms and behaviors is Todd Whitaker. He is one of my all-time favorites too. And so he's another name that if you're looking for some great ideas to help with um setting up expectations in your classroom. Harry Wong, Todd Whitaker, they are fantastic. So you can see we have about 172 people who have entered and it looks like number two, the most successful classes mm -hmm. are those where the teacher has a clear idea of what is expected from students and the students know what the teacher expects from them. And um, all of those quotes are great, um, but you can see the one that seemed to speak to the most of you. And I love that it's a very positive statement. You're looking into uh, what the most successful classes um, do. And I know that y'all are looking to be the most successful that you can. I do. I'm looking through the chat, um, Bonnie, and there's some great comments. Um, and I see some more numbers in there as well. If those amount had trouble if you were on another device using the poll. So we appreciate you using it that way. But I see one, and, and Catherine, I just want you to know you are not alone. So, uh, Catherine, if you don't mind me sharing your um, comment, but she said something, um, I can barely get some students to sit down so I can instruct them some days, even after we have gone over class rules. So if you're wondering, like, I'm a bad teacher because my students are not sitting down, I'm this new teacher trying, we need you to know that that um, that is not uncommon, that I would say those of us who have been in those first few weeks of teaching, um, I was sharing with the, the teachers this morning, you know, being a very young teacher, teaching much older students. I remember on the first few days of school, um, maybe first few weeks of school, um, asking myself, is this is, is this the right profession for me? Um, and we're going to share with you, Catherine, and everyone else, um, and that's in another session on how do you get past the, the behaviors to do the work? Now, what you have to establish, of course, are norms. That is the number one thing to say. These are the things that are most important for you to learn and for me to be your teacher. Beyond that, what are those structures and strategies we have in place to mitigate those behaviors? So we want you to know, those of you, I can see some of you going, yep, um, please know we understand that and that that is something we'll be addressing as well. So this theory focuses heavily on establishing those routines. Oops, so the poll jumped in my way. Nope, sorry. Um, Let me go back. There you go. That wasn't you. That was me. Um, heavily on establishing those routines, those things that happen in the classroom that students can come to expect and procedures, um, the way students carry out routines. And so we want to make sure that we have good, solid, heavily established routines where students know what those expectations are. And now we here, had some, go ahead. I'm sorry, go ahead, Melissa. No, no, I tell you what, if you'll talk through that one, I'll get the other poll uh, going. Perfect. Here we have the four stages of teaching and you can see where we have um, at the bottom fantasy. And so what Harry Wong says about fantasy it's really about the first two days of school um, that you're living in the idealistic world, what you think um, everything should exactly look like. And then you move into the stage of survival. Um, moving out of the stage of survival, you go to mastery where um, your students are able to take those uh, routines and master them. And then you're looking at impact. So that impact is really affecting what's going on in your classroom academically and um, with your students. So the big question, the poll is which 
U-N. Are you in number one, fantasy? Number two, survival? Number three, mastery? Or number four, uh, impact? And number four, of course, is where we want to end up in the end because we want to make sure we're making those impact. But it takes a while to get there for sure. Now, when we were brushing up on our Harry Wong, um, you know, knowledge, I thought it was very interesting that um, he made a note that fantasy and survival often happen on the exact same day. So your very first day of teaching, you've watched all these movies, you went into like, it's going to be just like this. I'm going to wear my hair a certain way, or I'm going to wear this nice suit. And the kids are just going to sit there and listen to me. And it's just going to be a great day. Um, and as he said something, what was like two hours later, they find they're in survival mode. Um, so if that was your experience, no, you are not alone. Have any of you ever seen like on Facebook or social media, the teachers, and these are veteran teachers, and they show a picture of them on the very first day of school. Like this is what I look like at seven. And then it shows a picture of what they look like at 3.30. Have you seen those? First yes. day of school, last day, uh, last day of school for a school year. Oh, uh, that too. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. Um, I make sure I'm going to, I'm going to share this poll. So make sure you can see it. Um, are you able to see the results now? Yes. Okay, good. Um, does that surprise any of you? Uh, I mean, it's, um, I, I can see some of those that are in the fantasy. Um, now I got to I tell you, and I, I will say, i I feel this way. Um, I came into teaching thinking, you know, I, I watched those movies and I'm like, I'm going to be that teacher. I'm going to be the one that changes everything. And I would have folks try to say, you know, you're too idealistic. But I, I think there's a little piece of of us that that fantasy piece never goes away. Yeah. Like I always feel like, OK, I can be the one. Sometimes we do get kicked in the gut or we have a bad day or we're just overwhelmed and that survival kind of comes into play. But I think there's always that piece of, of, of teachers that like, no, I, I can do this. I can do this even when it's hard. So I'll, there let, are, I'll mm -hmm. let you take this, this area. Okay, and I'm going to take move the poll out of your faces. Let's see that. Thank you. So four characteristics of effective teachers, um, and this is not an exhaustive list, but these are um, criteria that Harry Wong has established as these are these are the big rocks. And the first one is classroom management. And I'm seeing lots of um, comments in the chat um, about classroom management, and that is the number one thing when you establish those rules. You know, I was I was saying at the beginning. When I became a first um, year teacher teaching much older students who, um, you know, most of my students had um, had a lot of discipline infractions. They were actually put into that class because they had been in so many ISSs and they had been suspended for a number of times. And those were my those are my first students. And I, I learned very quickly from my elementary colleagues that those big kids they need just as many rules and expectations, if not more, than my younger students. So did you see Jeff's, um, He when, it, when I shared his picture a minute ago, it showed his norms and underneath it, I think he said like um, group names. That is something I would say that um, I, I certainly stole from my elementary counterparts. I loved as a high school teacher, I wanted to create response groups or groups in my classes and just like bonnie probably did in her classroom when i've created groups i'm like okay lucy you're the one that's going to staple the papers all right wilhelmina you're the one that's going to make sure everybody's you know signed off um kim you're the one every student in every group this is your role and my kids just took to it like that it was amazing so much so that I remember in my first year of teaching, another teacher who taught another content area but taught the same students, she came to me and she's like, what are, what are you doing? Why are, this, why are those kids so well behaved? And I'm like, because I've been hanging out with second grade teachers and I've learned about routines and norms and my kids, these big kids, they just want someone to say, no, baby, you can't do that. Um, Subject area confidence. Now we notice in your very first reflections, 
um, you noted that's something you're still growing in. You know, like I'm teaching this science, but this particular science is not my area of expertise. So I'm learning more about physical science or I'm teaching geometry and I'm more of an algebra person. Effective delivery, which takes time to how do you teach what you know to your students. So a lot of a lot of a lot of us have probably had teachers who were amazingly smart. Did you have teachers like that in school? Like geniuses. But when it came to giving it to us in a way that we could understand it, they really struggled. Do you know people like that? That's a gift. You know, you've heard that expression and it is a true thing. What is that? The kids don't care how much you know until what? You know how much they care. Like that's research based. That's just not a fuzzy comment. That is a that is that is fact positive expectations and and we'll be talking about this as well so here's the crazy thing and i was sharing a video um earlier today with another group but a lot of times we go into classrooms and these kids think that we have low expectations of them coming into the gate because either they have some sort of discipline record or their grades don't reflect x y or z or their whatever and so the kids will model what we think so I was in a school not too long ago, um, and I had even asked the the. We were, I was walking around with the principal, and and uh, a teacher had to leave suddenly, and I, it was a seventh grade teacher. And I told the principal, I'm like, I'll teach it. You know, I'd love to teach. It's an English class, seventh grade. It's my it's it's my cup of tea. And she's like, Oh no no no! Like this is these these kids are tough. I don't know about that. And I said, I will tell you what, I said, you come back in ten minutes. And if you're uncomfortable with me teaching this class the rest of the day, then it will not hurt my feelings at all. So I walk into this group of students. Um, they've never met me before, do not know me from Adam's house cat. And the video that I shared today with um, these, these new teachers is the video that the principal came and she came back in 10 minutes, just like I asked her to. I said, hey, get out your phone. And um, in eight minutes, I wanna brag a little bit, I had taught the entire class how to say the alphabet backwards. It is a gift I have. I could teach you, but we don't have time. And so the video that she did or the kids saying Z, Y, X, W, V. And she looked at me. She's like, all right, girl, you got it. Um, have at it. And the thing was, I told the kids, I am such a good teacher. I can teach you how to say the alphabet backwards. And you are so smart. You can do it. And you know what? They did. So it, there is so much research about going into the classroom saying, I know I can make the difference. So I have positive expectations of myself, but I also know every single child in here deserves an accomplished, amazing teacher. And I know they can learn. You know, I, I think back to the first norm you had there on, uh, or the first um, section there on classroom management. And I think um, a phrase I heard many times by mentors, which was busy hands make happy hands. Mm -hmm. And if they've got a purpose and they know what to do, then a lot of times you're going to end up with a, um, a better experience because they have something to do. And those positive expectations, like you just talked about in that, that um, scenario, Melissa, I mean, I can just, I can just picture you right there in front of the classroom and them just hanging on every word because you have set the stage for what it's going to be like. You've told them that you are a great teacher and you are you are going to be able to teach them this and that they are brilliant students and they're going to be able to grab it. The thing that we probably need to warn them about, um, you know, Bonnie, Sue Ellen, Shanthia, is these kids, they will find you in 10 years, either on social media, mm -hmm. Facebook, Walmart, I don't care where you are. And once you're a teacher, you can never go into a public place again without being like, Miss Short. Um, you know, and being a high school, you know, middle school person, I used to always tell my kids on the last day of school, like, okay, so we're forever connected. So when you're picking out, you know, your apples or your underwear or your whatever at Walmart with your wife or your husband, I want you to drop everything and introduce me and hug my neck, you know, and now you don't have to tell little people that because they will find you, they will drop, is that not right? They will drop everything and come find you. But um, it is amazing how kids that know you believe in them, they never forget that. Never, never, never. And oftentimes it's the students that you would least expect 
that are the ones that just really seek you out um, to no end. And I I think about a friend, of uh, a student of mine that I see at um, Sam's on a regular basis, he works in the meat department. He's been working there for four years. And I mean, like he regularly seeks me out every time I'm there in the store. And I treasure the time that I've spent with him but he didn't always like me. I'm going to tell you, there were moments he didn't like me because of the expectations that I had for him. But in the end, it tells me he really did like me. You know, there really was something to holding him accountable and, you know, making him do certain, certain things. Yeah. I, I have found that too, Bonnie, that the students I was maybe the toughest with are the ones that seek you out later and, and thank you. Um, this is a con, this is a, um, I've seen this several times on different social media platforms and every time I see it, it just, it just kind of puts a, a fire in my, my belly to, this is why I became a teacher. Um, but this is also the student I was, you know, the, I am sitting here in front of you today because I had elementary teachers who believed in me when uh, perhaps other people did not, who uh, I had two teachers in two different years that didn't even know each other in two different cities that, you know, took me home on the weekends um, who, you know, told me I was smart. And the fact that these two women saw something in me that I did not see in, in myself, it's, it's incredible the power of those small acts, how they can have ripple effects for decades. So we can talk about a lot of important things and we are, we're going to talk about standards in a couple of weeks. We're going to talk about a lot of things, but when we go into our classrooms and we establish these structures and routines, we can never underestimate, no matter how old they are, to know that this is the expectation and my teacher believes in me. My teacher thought I was smarter than I was, so I was. Now, here are some of his um, characteristics of a well-managed classroom. And it's interesting because next week um, we have two Alabama Teacher of the Years. Uh, we have an elementary and a secondary. So one thing we're gonna do next week a little differently now that we've had some time kind of getting used to each other is next week we're gonna join the whole group um, Zoom meeting as we are, as we have been. And then we are actually going to break into two totally different groups. We're going to break into an elementary group and we're going to break into a secondary group. And so both of these um, former Alabama Teacher of the Years are really going to break it down into classroom management. So I shared with them these slides so that they're going to take it to the next level. So I do not want to like jump on some of the great stuff I know they've got coming. But to kind of begin that discussion, Harry Wong's four characteristics of a really well-managed classroom is that what did Bonnie just say about the, the busy hands, a high level of student involvement with the lesson. Um, we have tried as hard as we can in a Zoom setting, not being able to be in front of you and, you know, um, engage with you in the normal way to provide opportunities for you to be engaged. Um, our students, you can just see it in their body language when they just start like zoning out. So what are we doing in our classroom to keep them engaged? Uh, we've been very clear about um, establishing norms. So those student expectations, avoiding wasted time, confusion or disruption. I was looking at the slides for next week and um, I know one of them, um, the, the instructor said something like, quit, quit giving, okay, we've got 15 minutes left in the class, y'all do your homework. Um, if you you got to be careful with that because that last 15 minutes is when the crazy things happen. And so she's going to share some really great things to do in those secondary classrooms. Little wasted time, little confusion, disruption, um, and that everything is very skill and task oriented. So, and there's a balance. When you say, Bonnie, there is a balance with being very structured, like this is the expectation, but the students, when they walk in your classroom, they just feel like, ah, oh, I'm in a safe place. This is welcoming. Um, Bonnie, I love to pick her brain because um, elementary, those that serve those early grades, I think it is incredible what you do every day. But this is something I think elementary teachers do really, really well and secondary teachers because of the nature of our content. You know, we teach seven periods and you go to the next class, I give the next 30 kids, you go to the next class. It takes a lot of um, intention to have classrooms that that have that atmosphere. What would you say, Bonnie? Absolutely. I mean, it, it's a it's a challenge regardless. 
there's different challenges on either side of the fence. And having been an elementary principal of pre-K through sixth grade, I had teachers who were departmentalized and they rotated children. And so they would have, um, you know, either multiple subjects or one subject throughout a given day, but multiple groups of students. So they're having to really struggle to get to know their students. They may not have to spend as much time on um, prep because they may only have one or two subjects that they're prepping for, but really getting to know those students can be such a challenge. And on the other hand, if you are an elementary teacher, you're teaching, you may even be teaching PE. You're teaching all the subjects. Um, and so you have to pre prep for all of those. But clear routines will help you on either end of that. If students know exactly what to do when they come into the classroom, if you've got a certain task that you're gonna have ready for them every time, that's gonna help set the stage and it's gonna reduce your prep work regardless of which side um, of the of the dynamic you're in. Um, I, I love throwing people under the bus, but I see Carissa Lambert in the room. Uh, she's like, oh God. Um, but <laughs> Carissa Lambert is a secondary um, English teacher. And I, I love telling folks I've known uh, Miss Lambert since she was, as she calls it, a baby teacher. Um, and she's actually going to be presenting in a couple of weeks and it is going to be fabulous. But um, having, you know, worked with Carissa when she was a classroom teacher at multiple levels, mostly the upper grades, um, I was always um, so amazed with how intentional she was with her lessons. And if you looked in her classroom, her kids, I mean, it wasn't always a quiet classroom. You know, there's a thing called learning noise. Carissa, do you want to expound on that just a little bit? Do you mind me? Um, passing the mic to you because I know this is an area in which you have a lot of expertise. No, I don't mind at all. Um, I'll say that um, when I, first of all, I was an emergency cert teacher. So when I came into the profession, I had no teaching classes. I didn't know anything. Um, I was totally green and um, I just came in with content knowledge about English of all things just literature, because we're not taught how to teach kids how to read. We're not taught all the explicit things that we really need to know. We're just taught how to analyze literature. Um, so I was a master at that, but the, all of the things that you guys have the privilege of learning within these prep sessions, I didn't have, but I, what I did have was a great mentor teacher who told me that in my classroom, the best piece of advice she could give me is that every day we needed to read, we needed to write, and we needed to talk. And so I took that to heart. Even from those beginning years, I recognized that um, a loud classroom, as long as it's controlled chaos, is usually a classroom that's learning because those that are talking are the ones that are learning. Um, so if it's just teacher talk all the time, those kids have tuned you out. Um, so I, I, I would say that it was probably the loudest room in the, in the building, but it was always intentional. And, um, and I mean, I'll just say that this too was the very first book that I got that had anything to do with education and it pretty much became the Bible. So Mm -hmm. uh, you guys are so fortunate to be in this. Thank you, Carissa. And we did send you all, it's an older copy, um, but you can certainly get a, a newer version, but we sent you an online copy last week so that you can just go through the whole thing. So as we're kind of wrapping up and we know you'll be mad at us, we do not give you an opportunity to get into your breakout rooms and, and dive in a little bit. Uh, Bonnie and I wanted to kind of share some of um, Harry Wong's big rocks and I'll just kind of start it off. So what you do on the first day, so starting today, moving forward, can determine your success and your student's success as a teacher. Have the room ready for instruction. Make it welcoming. This is so underrated. Stand mm -hmm. at the door and greet your kids by, by their names. They're not going to be they're not going to be mean to you when you just said, hey, how'd you do in your baseball game yesterday? How's your grandma doing? Missed you yesterday. Pat them on the back when they're walking in the door. You're going to be able to see those students who are having a struggling day. They might 
you know, stomp through as they're passing you by or they grumble and it's out of nature. That is such a powerful thing, Melissa, for sure. Start each class with an assignment immediately. Proximity is critical. Position yourself in the room near the students. Problems are proportional to distance. If you have students who are not on task, students who are talking, as you're teaching, go stand beside them. Don't stop teaching because you got 20 other kids listening to you. Get near them so they can feel your presence. And many times that's all. Instead of being in the front of the room and saying, hey, um, Bethany, stop that, because then you've given them what they want many times, and that is you've stopped instruction and you've given them um, an opportunity to be seen. So whether it's a student whose head's on the desk, it could be something that is not a disruption, but something that's a concern, but certainly placing your students, yourself near the students is, is critical. And I think about um, adults are the same way, like it's just human nature. It's not just Bethany. It is humans and at faculty meeting I do the same thing I would walk over to a group of teachers that were um, maybe not as tuned in to what uh, that they needed to be so just understand that it's not um, it's not that somebody is bad it's just that they've been distracted or um, they're working on being distracted and distracting themselves dress in a professional man manner to model success and expect expect achievement and when I talk about professional professional manner I'm not just talking about let's, you know, have a suit on as we come, you know, to teach school, but really think about what is it that sets you to be the expert. And um, if you're rolling out of bed and you get, have your baseball hat on, or if your hair is not fixed, or if you haven't done your makeup, um, if you're not putting your best foot forward, that's not being professional. That's not being respectful to your audience. So you want to make sure that you are looking like the part, that you have taken the time to get yourself ready for them. I feel like a little bit like a broken record, but we're trying to model exactly what Harry Wong said, and that is repetition. So those first and those most important things that must be taught in those first few weeks of school are discipline, procedures, and routines. Set rules, consequences, and rewards immediately. And sometimes a reward is a praise. And I heard somebody in the chat who had mentioned about praising. And don't forget that even the older ones like to hear that they've done something well. And I can tell you with my personal child that sometimes I would get frustrated and you got to pick up, you got to pick up your socks. Why are your socks on the floor? You've got to, and I mean, I would notice that that his, um, he, he just would become defeated. You could just see that he was defeated. So they need that positivity to the older ones, the younger ones, the everyone. Hmm. State your procedures and rehearse them. Even when you think, oh my gosh, I'm so tired of saying this until they become routines. Just that is part of your routine is to talk about the routines. Wait five or more seconds after asking a question, give them that wait time. And I've seen teachers who have procedures for that. They'll say, nobody's going to say anything until I point to you or give a certain signal. So um, that's another great strategy. Now, as a young teacher, it, to me, it was so awkward to ask a question and then everybody's just looking at you. So um, I also learned a lot of great things from elementary folks about, I want you, I'm going to give a question, think about it. Now turn to a friend or write it down. Um, you got to get past that awkward silence. Wait time is an incredible strategy. So as before we go into a breakout room, we're just kind of um, revisiting a, a few of those first few week things that we know are going to be important. And that is, of course, to explain, to model, demonstrate those procedures, to rehearse and practice these procedures and reinforce it. Um, reteach, rehearse over and over and over again until the kids are like, OK, I get it. Because when you especially if you're coming in in the 
you know, you weren't there on the very first day of school. And so here you are jumping in. That creates a lot of um, nuances that someone that gets to start off the school year with a, with students does not have. And so creating those opportunities for reinforcement is just absolutely critical. And um, Bonnie and I were saying when we were going through this, like, guess what? When they come back from Christmas break or spring break, you're like, did you did you forget um, a lot of times you have to go back through those norms um, and those uh, and those classroom rules again. It is not you when that happens. These procedures that must become student routines, they should happen at the beginning of the class. You need to have a specific routine on how you're going to quieten a class, quite Whitenton, that's hard to say, um, how you are going to provide differentiated instruction, answer student questions, help students need assistance, and then just all the papers and the technology and all of the things in your classroom, what are those things that you have in place to create structure so that it's not chaos when kids are turning in their papers or plugging in their machines or charging or whatever the case may be. We want you to think about these four things as you're thinking about norms in your classroom. What are those things you want to establish at the beginning? How do you settle a class down? How are you helping students that need help? And then um, how are you managing all of the stuff in your classroom? And of course, the end of class, how did they dismiss? You know, I love to see classrooms where when the bell rings, the kids are still waiting. They don't just get up and leave. They're waiting for you to say, you are dismissed. You can go. Um, so that you can finish saying what you're going to say and the bell hasn't rung and they're, they're gone. They're out the door. Structure generates behavior. Think about that as you're moving through your planning for your classroom, that if they have that structure, it is going to result in what you see from them. So with these five um, criteria being um, your starting point, we wanted to give you um, a few minutes in a breakout room to just kind of shout out in your group, what are some norms that you're thinking about establishing with whatever grade you have? Um, and you can just pick one, pick a norm for the beginning of the class, um, how you're going to settle a class, what the end of class would be. We'd like you to kind of get into groups for a moment or two and just kind of think with each other, what are some classroom procedures? And then maybe because some of you are like, I've been doing this for a minute. I already have routines. So for those of you that are well versed, please share. For those of you who, this is a good discussion. So I guess it's kind of obvious what the homework assignment is, right? So what we want you to do this week is to establish norms. Um, what are you thinking, Bonnie? What would be a good number? Anywhere between three to, she's saying five. Okay, I like that. That's a good. Five. Let's, let's establish, thank you. Let's establish three to five norms um, in your classroom. So we want you to do what we've done, go to your students and create an opportunity for them to be part of the norm norming protocol and then um, share them with them after you have come up with this is the most consistent um, norms that we have. And then next week in our reflection, you are going to share those norms with um, with your groups and, of course, with us. Shanthea, can you believe we are here we go now? Um, we are finished with um, week three. So now we'll be moving next week to classroom management. It is going to be an awesome session. And I think it is the perfect segue from this um, to, to that. Don't you agree, Ms. Washington? I do agree. I really do. Awesome. Um, and then from that, I will say we had some fun putting this syllabus together, but from classroom management, okay, so what happens when there are some significant discipline issues? How do you de-escalate? What does that look like? And so we're going to provide some structures that you can immediately put in place that week. Uh, don't forget, um, I looked yesterday, I didn't see any new stickies, but don't forget you've got the virtual cork board that you can use throughout the week to just post wonders, and we always make sure we get right to those. Um, next week, our essential question is going to be around what classroom practices, classroom management practices and protocols should an accomplished teacher exhibit. We are all going to come here first, and then I'm going to send you off. 
So I think elementary um, teachers, those that serve, you know, K-5, K-6, those of you who are sixth grade teachers will let you just pick which one you want because you're kind of in that middle. Um, the elementary teachers are going to stay in here. And then secondary teachers, we're actually going to send you to a Google Meet so you can have some experience with that. Um, also, um, because one of the, actually both of them, but one of the presenters next week is absolutely crazy about her dogs, um, we are bring a pet night. So for those of you who have a pet, um, we will do a show your um, favorite animal. For those of you who don't have a pet, um, you can just enjoy all the wonderful friends that everyone else is bringing. Um, I'm particularly excited about showing off my cute little dog. Um, several of you have been asking about the attendance and we, we learned last week because we are norming ourselves to do this at the very end. So, um, we're going to put the link in the chat. Um, you've got the QR codes. It is critical before you finish tonight that you have registered your attendance, that you answer those. I'm going to click on it that you have answered those, um, homework questions that Ms. Washington gave us. Let me scooch y'all down just a little bit. Let me try that one more time. Now, I'm going to throw this in the chat. Use your or use your phone, either one. And just like last week, we had an awesome group that just kind of stayed and had some lingering questions. But another thing we're going to do tonight, and we will do this from this point forward, is we are going to create a breakout room that if you just wanna go hang out with other folks that are in um, this program, we're gonna have an elementary and a secondary room. If you just wanna stay here because you've got questions for Ms. Washington, I see Mr. Jones is in, Ms. Lambert, Ms. Short, um, to, you know, anything with technology with Ms. Um, Gilliland, know that we'll stay on and answer questions, but I'm gonna send you, as you're finishing your assignment, you're gonna get an invite to